simply trusting every day, trusting through a stormy way, even when my faith is small, trusting Jesus that is all, trusting as the moments fly, trusting as the days go by, trusting Him whatever befall, trusting Jesus that is all. Brightly doth His Spirit shine, exciting study in the Word of God. We're in Acts chapter 7, and we are looking at Simon, Samaria, and sorcery, and salvation. I just realized I'd left my notes back there on the uh, small table. We're in Acts chapter 8, and looking at verses 6 and 7. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again we thank you for the privilege of being here tonight. We thank you for your word. It describes for us the real world that you see, not merely the physical world, but also the spirit world. We thank you that you have revealed to us what is there, because otherwise we would not know and we would be easily deceived. And yet, Father, your word has declared to us the truth concerning the spirit realm, both the holy angels and the fallen angels, Satan and his host. And, Father, we recognize that they are enemies of our soul. We recognize that they appear as an angel of light, and it's no great thing if their agents, their ministers, appear as ministers of righteousness. And so, Father, we pray for your blessing upon the going forth of your word tonight, that it would go forth with clarity and power, that we would understand what an immense subject this is in Scripture, how many different types of wicked occult practices there are, and they still exist today, 
not merely in ancient times in faraway Babylon, but exist today here in the United States, and Christians must stay far away from them. So, Father, we pray for your blessings upon this time together. We pray for your word that it will take root in our hearts and grow and abound in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, so that we might be faithful in the spiritual war in which we find ourselves. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The sword of the Spirit is the word of God. That is the only offensive weapon that we have against the forces of darkness. We're told that in Ephesians chapter 6. And so, having a good grasp on that sword, understanding what the word of God has to say about the spirit world, and about the enemies which face us in the spirit world, and those who are their agents here on this earth, helps us to be well forewarned and forearmed <clears throat> so that we might be able to avoid the pitfalls and the traps that Satan has laid. There are many of them he lays for children, but there are also many that he lays for adults who very foolishly allow their families and children to get involved in various occult practices which are very prevalent even here in the United States. If you go to any circus, any carnival, any bazaar, any kind of fair, you will find people there who will read your palm. You'll find people there who are involved in tarot cards. You'll find people there who will give you your horoscope or who will read a crystal ball for you. Uh, it is very widespread. Horoscopes are in over 1,700 newspapers in the United States today. And there are Christians who, perhaps only out of curiosity, or so they say, read the horoscopes. But many get sucked into that, whereby they are depending on what the horoscope says for the way in which they order their day. That is wickedness, that is sin, that is occultic practice. God condemns it and God judges those who are involved in it. I say that up front because as we go through the scriptures, and we probably will not get through all of these different terms tonight, but all of those terms, which we see, some of them with different names today, but the practices which they practice are all outlined and described for us in Scripture. And we see in every case God's judgment is on those who practice them, on those who participate with them, even those who are believers, even those who are in positions of high authority. You think of Saul going to the witch of Endor. God's judgment is on them and the penalty is death. Very serious subject that we are talking about tonight. Now last week we began our study of what kind of demonic activity and demon possession faced Philip at the Samaritan Revival. And we saw that it was an opposition from a particular group, which is a very large group of the demonic forces, which were called unclean spirits. Now we find there are multiple different divisions of the demonic realm, the spirit realm, outlined for us in Ephesians chapter 6, where we are given the armor which defends us and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, <coughs> against the rulers of darkness, and so on. Each of those is a military term that describes different echelons of demonic forces. But the group that we're talking about tonight, which is very prevalent in Scripture, are those which are called the unclean spirits. And we saw last week that many of the crowd were demon-possessed people. It wasn't just a small number, it was a huge number. It wasn't a rare thing then, it's not a rare thing now. This is a moral term that is used concerning them. Unclean does not merely mean that they have rolled in the dirt. Unclean deals with moral depravity. We saw last week that it's used of sodomy and lesbianism. We saw that it's used of habitual immorality. Those who are bound by it, they cannot break away from it. We saw that it's used of fornication and shameless nudity. We saw that it is listed with adultery, fornication, and lasciviousness in the works of the flesh. We saw that it is portrayed as a brainless, unfeeling, greedy, passionate immorality. And we noted that greed and covetousness are often tied to immorality and uncleanness in the Bible because there is money to be made, Scripture calls it filthy lucre, with nudity and immorality. And as you know, pornography is one of the largest grossing businesses in the world today. It's not merely a matter of being controlled by the lust of the flesh. It is something that is promulgated by demonic forces. We saw in Ephesians chapter 5, it's classified with fornication, covetousness, filthiness, idolatry, obscenity, and whoremongering. And we are commanded to have no fellowship with it, but rather to reprove it. Verse 11, have no fellowship 
with the unfruitful works of darkness. It has just listed that list, but rather reprove them. Colossians chapter 3 includes it with fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, that is evil illicit desires for that which is forbidden, covetousness, blasphemy, and filthy communication. And the word for filthy communication ties it with vile, shameful, immoral conversations, swearing, and minced oaths. These are things that we ought not as Christians to be participating in because those are things that are motivated by Satan himself and the demonic host. <clears throat> they want you to use your mouth, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on, out of the heart, proceed things from our mouth, and Jesus says that those are the unclean things that defile a man. <clears throat> Excuse me. Moral sin is called uncleanness, and it's contrasted with holiness. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. In other words, holiness is the opposite of the sin of uncleanness. If you are walking in a holy life, you will be pleasing to God, and you will be avoiding this sin. And verse 8, which immediately follows the verse that I just read to you, reminds us that he that despiseth, that is, despises what is being taught on this subject by the Apostle Paul, despises not man, but God, who also hath given unto us his Holy Spirit. We've not been called to uncleanness, but unto holiness, because God has called us and given us his Holy Spirit. And so we are despising God when we involve ourselves in any form of moral uncleanness. We saw that uncleanness is one of the main character marks of the apostates in 2 Peter 2. We saw that unclean spirits work miracles and control the world during the tribulation, and unclean spirits are able to work miracles today. Uh, we'll discover that they've been doing that historically all the way back to the days of Moses, where we see the contest between Moses and the magicians and the sorcerers of Egypt who were able to perform some miracles, but God limited what they could do. Nonetheless, they were performing supernatural acts. We see that also that they can control uh, certain uh, aspects of the elements of the natural world and they can control people. We look at the book of Job and we see that Satan specifically is able to control elements of the natural world and he also motivates people as Job's various children are being killed and as other things are happening in the life of Job. And Satan can also affect the human body as we see when God allows him to go out and Job becomes covered with boils. Satanic attack is no joke. Satanic working in the world is no joke. The demons are alive and well, and they are your enemies, and they hate you, and they will do whatever they can to destroy you. The scripture makes that very clear. We saw that they are motivated by sexual impurity, of the nudist gathering we talked about last week, and after he was saved and the demons cast out, he was clothed and in his right mind. They affect the way you think. We pointed out that the reason we were making such a point out of this was because most people have no idea that this is a sin. Second, as you can see, it's condemned repeatedly in Scripture. Third, if the Bible talks about it repeatedly, God is making a point that he wants us to stay far away from it. And fourth, because it's so closely connected with demonic activity controlling the flesh, the fallen old sin nature that inhabits man. And you and I have not eradicated that old sin nature. When we got saved, the Holy Spirit came to dwell inside us and he gave us a new nature. But we are still tempted. We still fall into sin. We are still subject to Satan's attacks. And if we are not walking by faith in the power of the Spirit of God, we can find ourselves falling into these kinds of immoral sins. There have been believers in the past who have done so to great cost to themselves, to great shame to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to great damage in their families and in their churches. It's a very serious issue. And so that is why we are talking about it. We pointed out last week that there was a contrast between the holy clothing worn by the priests in the Old Testament and the way in which Satan seeks to unclothe man. From the very beginning, after man fell into sin, as a result of temptation from Satan, he lost whatever covering of light he had, and God had to cover him. Man tried to cover himself with leaves. God killed animals to cover him. He covered them with skins, probably the skins of a lamb or a sheep. 
because those are the things that later became the sacrifices showing the covering of sin in the Old Testament. The word atonement means to cover, kafar. It only occurs once in the New Testament because our Lord Jesus Christ doesn't just cover our sins, he takes our sins away. Wonderful truth taught by that absence of the word atonement as we move into the New Testament. We saw that unclean demons possess people and they show up in religious settings. We saw the unclean spirit in the man in the synagogue in Nazareth. We saw that the type of demon possession that is possession by an unclean spirit can also happen to young children. We saw two illustrations, a little girl in Mark chapter 7 verse 25 and a little boy in Mark chapter 9 verses 21 through 29. So tonight that brings us to the next part of understanding what this uncleanness is all about. In verses 6 and 7 we see these unclean spirits crying with a loud voice coming out of many that are possessed with them and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. So there's a many in relation to the unclean spirits. There's also a many in relation to those with palsies and those who are lame. But what are the differences? We need to make a contrast with uncleanness in the Old Testament where we see the term unclean occurs 194 times altogether in the Bible, but of that 162 of those occurrences are in the Old Testament and only 32 times does the term unclean occur in the New Testament. And that's only a partial list. That's just when we see the word unclean. But there's also the word uncleanness, and I haven't even counted up those numbers. And there are also times where those words that are translated unclean show up with a different translation. So it is a very large subject as we look at scripture. But there are differences in the way it's used in the Old Testament and the way that it's used in the New Testament. Uncleanness in the Old Testament is much broader. Much more frequently it's connected with specific Jewish prohibitions that no longer apply to the church. In general, there are six different areas of uncleanness in the Old Testament. Number one, uncleanness in relation to that which the body consumes, in other words, food. The uncleanness as it relates to dietary laws that no longer apply to the church. There are certain ritual things that God used as types and pictures to explain to us what he means by separation and by holiness. And food was one of those areas. For example, I'll just, uh, there is so much of this, I mean, um, <laughs> I, I've actually got a full page of the dietary laws here showing what you could not eat in the Old Testament. I'm going to read that to you, but that's just scratching the surface. This is all over, not just in the book of Leviticus. I'll read you some passages out of Leviticus. But it's all over the Old Testament in relation to dietary laws and God condemning the people, even in the prophets, for the things that they were eating. Those are things that no longer apply to us, as I'll show in a moment. And the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying unto them, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which ye shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Whatsoever parteth the hoof, and is cloven-footed, and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that shall you eat. So in other words, it had to have a split hoof, and it had to chew the cud. It had to be an animal like a cow or a sheep, because they are both cloven-footed, and they chew the cud. So God said, you can eat those. Nevertheless, these ye shall not eat of them that chew the cud, Oh, there are some that do chew the cud, but they don't divide the hoof as the camel. Because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof. He is unclean unto you. Now, those of you who were with us when we saw that uh, incredible missionary video about South Sudan and um, Ethiopia uh, saw as the missionary who is central in this film walks through the marketplace in a very Muslim area. And here they are eating camels because camels are more common than cattle and sheep because the camels can live in this very arid area. Well, under the Mosaic law, you couldn't eat camels even if they were very plentiful and you didn't have any ca cows or sheep because the camel chews the cud but it does not have a cloven hoof. And the coney, because he cheweth the cud but divideth not the hoof. He is unclean to you. 
and the hare, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof. He is unclean to you. And the swine, though he divide the hoof and be cloven-footed, pigs have a split foot, though he be cloven-footed, yet he cheweth not the cud. He is unclean to you. Of their flesh shall you not eat, and their carcass shall you not touch. They are unclean to you. You couldn't even have a pet pig that you patted and fed with apples. These shall you eat of all that are in the waters. Whatsoever hath fins and scales in the waters, in the sea and in the rivers, them ye shall eat. And all that have not fins and scales in the sea and in the rivers, of all that move in the waters, of any living thing which is in the waters, they shall be an abomination to you. There are things out there that swim but don't have fins and scales, like eels, for example. Or sharks, they've got a leather hide. They don't have scales. They've got fins, but not scales. And I suspect most folks in here have at least at some time tried like Mako shark or something like that. Uh, you know, that was an unclean thing in the Old Testament. They shall be even an abomination unto you. You shall not eat of their flesh, but ye shall have their carcasses in abomination. Whatsoever hath no fins nor scales in the water, that shall be an abomination unto you. So you couldn't eat crabs, you couldn't eat shrimp, you couldn't eat lobster, you couldn't eat oysters, you couldn't eat scungili or calamari, octopus or squid. <laughs> you know, it was pretty strict. What you could eat and what you could not eat. And these are they which you have an abomination among the fowls, they shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle and the ossifrage and the osprey and the vulture. I don't know anybody who wants to eat vulture, but there it is. And the kite after his kind, every raven after his kind, and the owl and the night hawk and the cuckoo, and the hawk after his kind, and the little owl and the cormorant and the great owl, and the swan and the pelican and the gear eagle and the stork and the heron after her kind and the lapwing and the bat. When was the last time you really wanted a, a, a good serving of bat? All fowls that creep upon, going upon all four shall be an abomination unto you. Yet these may ye eat of every flying, creeping thing that goeth upon all four, which have legs above their feet to leap withal where on the earth. In other words, grasshoppers. Even of these of them you may eat, the locust after his kind, the bald locust after his kind, the beetle after his kind. Now aren't you glad that uh, even in the Old Testament they could eat beetles? And you can eat beetles today if you want. You don't have to, but uh, it was, an, it was a, clean, a clean insect in the Old Testament. And the grasshopper after his kind. But all other flying, creeping things which have four feet shall be an abomination unto you. And for these you shall be unclean. Whosoever touches the carcass of them shall be unclean until the even. So if you touched a bug that wasn't listed among these clean insects that you could eat, you were unclean for all the rest of the day. You know, God was making a point here, wasn't he? In other words, they had to be very, very, very careful about everything they touched. Walking through the desert, you step on a scorpion, you're unclean till evening. Of course, you wouldn't want to step on a scorpion in any case, but there it is. And whosoever beareth aught of their carcass of them shall wash his clothes and shall be unclean until even. The carcasses of every beast which divideth the hoof and is not cloven-footed, nor cheweth the cud, are unclean unto you. Every one that toucheth them shall be unclean. And whatsoever goeth upon his paws among all manner of beasts that go on all four, these are unclean to you. Whosoever toucheth their carcass shall be unclean. In other words, you can't eat cats and dogs. They go on their paws. There are people who do. In China, they eat cats and dogs. He that beareth the carcass of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until even. They are unclean to you. These also shall be unclean unto you among the creeping things that creep upon the earth. The weasel and the mouse and the tortoise after his kind. Anybody for a big dish of mice? And the ferret and the chameleon and the lizard and the snail. How about escargot? French eat those. Some folks here in America do too. And the mole. You see, people are tempted to eat all kinds of things when they're hungry. These are unclean to you among all that creep. Whosoever doth touch them when they be dead shall be unclean unto the even. Did you know that uncleanness extended not only to the person who either ate or touched <coughs> these kinds of creatures, but also anything that 
these creatures touched, especially if they were dead, become, became unclean. There was a ritual uncleanness that God imposed upon Israel. We are not Israel. That God imposed upon Israel so that they could not even touch some of these things. And if those things touched some container that they owned, the container was unclean. Listen to this. Upon whatsoever any of them, when they are dead, doth fall, it shall be unclean, whether it be a vessel of wood or raiment or skin or sack. Whatsoever vessel it be, wherein any work is done, it must be put into water, and it shall be unclean into the even, so it shall be cleansed. You shall not make yourselves abominable with any creeping thing that creepeth, neither shall you make yourselves unclean with them, that you should be defiled thereby. Words used together, abominable, unclean, defiled. Interesting to track all of those. We don't have time, but there are hundreds of references as you go through Scripture and see the things that defile. See the things that are abominable in the sight of God. You discover that word over and over again in the book of Revelation, for example. Things that are abominable to God. Things that are an abomination to God. To make a difference between the unclean and the clean, and between the beast that may be eaten and the beast that may not be eaten. Now, did you know that all of that law has been abrogated in Christ? All of those ritual things whereby you couldn't have pork or have a, a good ham at your Thanksgiving or Christmas, all of those things have been done away with in Christ. Paul says so in Colossians chapter 2. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Someday I hope the Lord willing to be able to preach through the book of Colossians because he deals with a lot of the things that we find still in the church today which try to drag believers back under the ritual law of the Old Testament. It's very sad. But he lists here in this context all of those things that have been done away with in Christ. The food laws, the drink laws, the holiday laws, the new moon laws, and the Sabbath day laws. He says you're not under those things. Those are a shadow of the things to come, but the body is of Christ. We find in Acts chapter 10, God made that very clear, especially on the eating business, to Peter. We'll be talking about this in detail, so I'll only read it now. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowl of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Now we just read that list. And that's only a partial list, big long list of all those dirty birds and all those weird little insects and all the unclean kinds of animals and, you know, all the different sea creatures that you cannot eat. You know, we normally think when that sheep gets let down out of heaven, maybe what he saw was a whole bunch of pigs. No, it had all kinds of things because it says so here. Four-footed beasts of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and fowls of the air. In other words, it covers all four areas that were prohibited under the Mosaic Law, which we've just read. That was the sheet let down from heaven. And Peter looked at it and said, Whoa, that is the grossest stuff I've ever seen in my life. I never saw so much of it together all in one place. I will never kill and eat it, although God had commanded him to do it. Rather interesting the voice spake unto him the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now we know that God is teaching him a lesson about the Gentiles, because that was an even more unclean thing for Peter than these unclean animals that were being let down from heaven in the sheet in his vision. But God never uses a false illustration to teach truth. God was making it clear to Peter that the church was no longer under the Jewish laws of dietary regulations as contained in the Old Testament. God was going to welcome in Gentiles who had never been under that 
and whom God would never put under that. You and I are Gentiles. Some of us may have some Jewish blood at some place way back in the distant past, but for the most part we're Gentiles. We have never been under the dietary laws of the Old Testament. And God was making that clear to Peter. In Romans chapter 14, verse 14, Paul writes, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything unclean, to him it is unclean. Now the context of Romans chapter 14 is that there are times that we may choose not to eat certain things in order to avoid offense. But Paul makes it very clear it is not because we are prohibited by the Old Testament dietary regulations. But as touching things offered unto idols, it's in a different context. It's in the context not of Old Testament regulations of dietary food that you can eat, but in the context of that which the pagans who became Christians had come out of. Food offered to idols at the temple. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. You and I can know an awful lot, but if we don't have God's agape love in dealing with the brethren, all it does is it puffs us up. Paul makes some very interesting plays on words as he goes through this passage and elsewhere as well. The difference between puffing up or building up. Whether we are swelled up, normally in our pride about how much we know, or whether we are building up the brothers and not causing them to stumble. Listen to what he says. <clears throat> if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. But if a man love God, the same is known of him. Better to be known by God because of your love for God than to know a lot about God and fail to exercise love for the brothers. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be many gods and lords many, but unto us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. How be it? There is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it, that is these things offered to idols, as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. In other words, the idol didn't do anything to that piece of meat. That piece of meat was offered to the idol, and the idol didn't zap it with some kind of demon rays. The idol didn't cover it with, you know, idol cooties. It was a piece of meat that got offered to the idol. And then it gets sold in what's called the shambles, that is the marketplace, so that people who want to buy a good cut of meat know that the very best meat is being offered to the idols. They go down and they buy that there, or perhaps there was even it seems to indicate here in the text, a little restaurant that was run by the pagan temple. Because that's what he says here. He says, uh, Meat commends us not to God, for if we eat, neither if we eat of the better, neither we eat of the worse, but take heed lest this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which hath knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple. In other words, you sit down to eat in the idol's temple. They apparently ran some kind of a restaurant connected to the temple. Shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? In other words, you have the right to eat there because there is nothing wrong with the meat. It hasn't been polluted. And you know that there's only one God and the idol is nothing. Although he tells us in other places that behind every idol there is a demon seeking to be worshipped. But he says, so you sit down there because you've never worshipped that idol. You don't think anything about it. But here comes along a man who has been saved out of that particular pagan religion who used to worship that idol there. And he sees you, who claim to be the stronger brother, sitting to eat in the local temple restaurant. And then his conscience 
is weak, but he sees you as a stronger brother doing it. So he says, well, it must be okay for me too. For if any man see thee which hath knowledge set at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. There are people who use this passage here to try to force believers in the church today back under the Old Testament dietary laws. It has nothing to do with the Old Testament dietary laws. Those were restrictions that God placed on the nation of Israel, not on the church. Paul has told us that. What he's talking about here is your sensitivity to a weaker brother who used to be an idol worshiper. He says the meat is okay, nothing wrong with the meat, because we know that there is no other God besides the one true God. But by you participating in that particular eating of that meat, you're wounding his weak conscience. Romans chapter 14. Him that is weak in the faith receives you, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. This is talking about vegetarians. There are some people who say, well, I'll solve that whole problem, I just won't eat meat at all. And so he is comparing them and contrasting them. And he's going to take several different illustrations to compare and contrast between what is the stronger brother and what is the weaker brother. One believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. It's the vegetarian who is the weaker brother. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. We can't have an arrogant attitude and say, well, you're a weaker brother, and so much for you, I don't care. I'll go ahead and eat it if I want. Let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. Like, oh, you are terrible. You're eating that poor, poor little baby cow. That veal that you're eating there, don't you realize it was once a happy little veal running across the hills? No, he can't despise his brother who eats meat either. For God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Then he gets another illustration. Now he's already told us that, you know, we're not under all those holy days and Sabbath days and so on. But he realizes that there are those in the church, even at Rome, who still worry about particular days. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another man esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be persuaded in his own mind. In other words, this is not an issue over which to fight. You know, somebody likes to consider one day more important than others and wants to celebrate on that day. We don't despise them for doing so, nor do we despise those who decide not to. These are not things the church should be fighting about. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. He that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. In other words, the body is a unit. We've already talked about that as we've been going through the spiritual gifts on Sunday morning. The hand cannot say to the foot, I have no need of thee. I can't say to the ear, I have no need of you. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? In other words, we need one another. These are not things over which we should divide. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be the Lord both of the dead and the living. But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother over these issues, these issues of food, these issues of holidays, these issues of things that we despise people for because they do or don't do? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. He's the one to whom we have to answer. What is your conscience 
telling you about the issues with which you struggle. Paul says that we're not to offend the conscience of the weaker brother. Let us not therefore judge one another, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded, here's the verse we started with, by the Lord Jesus, that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. It takes us back to the discussion of the unclean foods, or the failure to celebrate certain holidays, or the food that was offered in an idol's temple. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, destroy not him with thy meat, for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify one another. Remember we started out talking about knowledge puffs up, but what we want is not being fat-headed. What we want to do is to build up. That is what the term edify means. For meat, destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. The man who sees you eating, it really doesn't sit right with his conscience, but he thinks it's okay because he sees you as a stronger Christian eating. Then his conscience is defiled, and it's a pain to his conscience. And Satan will take that and use it as a goad against him. For it is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. Now the key verse in this entire passage is the last verse. Verse 23 of Romans 14. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. That is a key element of the definition of sin. We all know from the catechism that sin is the transgression of the law. But we also have the element of sin described for us here. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. If a person kept the law perfectly and was not living by faith, everything he does is sin. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. That's very important to remember that. Very important to remember that when you question yourself about the various things that he's talked about here, and the food and the drink and the holidays and the Sabbath days and all of that kind of thing. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Now we see uncleanness, the second area where uncleanness is used in the Old Testament, uh, not merely the issue of foods, which we see the contrast with the New Testament, but the second area of uncleanness in the Old Testament is the birthing process. Leviticus chapter 12, verse 2. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman have conceived seed and born a man-child, then she shall be unclean seven days. According to the days of the separation for her infirmity, shall she be unclean. And in the eighth day the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. But if she bear a maid child, then she shall be unclean two weeks, as in her separation, and she shall continue in the blood of her purifying threescore and six days. <clears throat> in other words, sixty-six days. And she shall then continue in the blood of her purifying three and thirty days. So, thirty-three more days, ninety-nine days total. She shall touch no hallowed thing, nor come into the sanctuary, until the days of her purifying be fulfilled. But if she bear a maid child, then she shall be unclean two weeks, as in her separation, and she shall continue in the blood of her purifying threescore and six days. And if she be not able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtles or two young pigeons, the one for the burnt offering and the other for a sin offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for her, and she shall be clean. 
That is an atonement, the covering for sin. It is seen as an unclean thing, the birthing of a child. Shorter time for the male child, longer time for the female child. Do you realize that that is exactly what Joseph and Mary were doing when they brought Jesus for his circumcision in Luke chapter 2? In fact, it quotes that text out of Leviticus that we've just read. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him, that is Jesus, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. That was what the poor people brought. If you were rich, you had to bring a lamb. We read that in the text. But if you were poor and couldn't afford to bring a lamb, you brought the two turtle doves or two young pigeons to offer unto the Lord. That's what Joseph and Mary did here. And of course, we find next that uh, Simeon, uh, who's looking for the coming of the Messiah, takes Jesus in his arms and asks the Lord to let him depart in peace. When we get into the New Testament, there's not much said on this issue, but we do have one hint over in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 14. Paul is talking there about married couples and situations which apparently the church at Corinth had written to him about, where the husband was saved and the wife was unsaved, or the wife was saved and the husband was unsaved. And Paul is answering questions about their children, whether or not their children have any hope of salvation. And Paul concludes in verse 14, the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean. Same word. But now are they holy. And the text there uses the term hagioi, which is the term for saints, translated that way in most of the places it's found in the New Testament. They are set apart ones. And uh, that's why I believe that Christian parents can look forward with eagerness to the salvation of their children, even if only one in the family was saved. Because he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Uh, wonderful, great promises to Christian parents concerning the ultimate salvation of their children. The third way in which unclean is used in the Old Testament is related to sexual or reproductive discharge. If any man's seed of copulation go out from him, then he shall wash all his flesh in water and shall be unclean until the even. And every garment and every skin whereon his seed of copulation shall be washed with water and be unclean until even. The woman also with whom man shall lie with seed of copulation, they shall both bathe themselves in water and be unclean until the even. And the woman, if a woman have an issue and her issue in her flesh be blood, she shall be put apart seven days and whosoever toucheth her shall be unclean until the even. And everything that she lieth upon in her separation shall be unclean. Everything also that she sitteth upon shall be unclean. And whosoever toucheth her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the even. And whosoever toucheth anything that she sat upon shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean and even until even. And if it be on her bed or on anything wherein she sitteth or when he toucheth it, he shall be unclean until even. And if a man lie with her at all, when her flowers be upon her, he shall be unclean seven days, and all the bed whereon he lieth shall be unclean. And if a woman have an issue of blood many days out of the time of her separation, or if it run beyond the time of her separation, all the days of the issue of her uncleanness shall be as the days of her separation. She shall be unclean. Every bed whereon she lieth, all the days of her issue shall be unto her as the bed of her separation. Whatsoever she sitteth upon shall be unclean, as the uncleanness of her separation. Whosoever toucheth those things shall be unclean, and shall wash his clothes, and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the even. But if she be cleansed of her issue, then she shall number herself seven days, and after that she shall be clean. And on the eighth day she shall take unto her tur two turtles, or two young pigeons, and bring them unto the priest to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall offer the one for a sin offering, and the other for a burnt offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for her before the Lord for the issue of her uncleanness. Thus shall you separate the children of Israel from their uncleanness, that they die not in their uncleanness when they defile my tabernacle that is among them. God was serious about this. This is the law of him that hath an issue, of him that whose seed goeth forth from him, and is defiled therewith, and of her that is sick of her flowers, 
and of him that hath an issue of the man and of the woman, and of him that lieth with her that is unclean. God said all of those issues from the human body made the person unclean, and to try to go to the tabernacle without following the law of uncleanness was the death penalty. God was serious about the issue of uncleanness. Other things that defile a man that come out of him, if there be among you any man that is not clean by reason of uncleanness that chanceth him by night, then shall he go abroad out of the camp, he shall not come within the camp. But it shall be, when even cometh, he shall wash himself with water, and when the sun is down, he shall come into the camp again. Thou shalt have a place also without the camp, whether thou shalt go forth abroad, and thou shalt have a paddle upon thy weapon, and it shall be, when thou wilt ease thyself abroad, thou shalt dig therewith, and shalt turn back and cover that which cometh from thee. For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of thy camp to deliver thee, and to give up thine enemies before thee. Therefore shall thy camp be holy, that he see no unclean thing in thee, and turn away from thee. Now, this is um, obscure language, but I think you understand what these things are talking about. This was part of the uncleanness of the Old Testament. The incredible way in which God, to show himself holy, he would come down in the camp of Israel and go through it. And he did not want to see any uncleanness in it. Do you think it is any less important when God, who is here present with us, views the church, those who are in it, that when we speak of spiritual and moral uncleanness, he does not want to see any of that in the church. These were pictures and symbols that God gave to Israel so that they might reflect in a visible manner the holiness of God. The demonic forces want to make the church unclean. For if they can do that, they know they will bring God's judgment upon the church, even as the judgment of God came upon Israel for its unclean acts. We find our Lord Jesus Christ talking about it in Matthew chapter 15, verses 10 and following. He explains that there are more things that defile a man that come out of him. He called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? Of course they would be, because you see, they were, they were picayune about the Old Testament dietary laws. And Jesus just said, What goes into the mouth is not what defiles you. They were worried about whether or not somebody was going to eat a bat, or was going to eat a mole, or was going to eat some kind of a toad. They were worried about whether or not somebody had gone out and, you know, gone shrimping and was going to eat a shrimp. Jesus said, what goes into your mouth is not what defiles you. They were offended at what Jesus said. His disciples said, don't you realize you just offended the Pharisees? Like, okay, haven't you ever heard me offend them before? But he answered and said, every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone, they be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Declare unto us this parable. Peter, you remember, all the way to Acts chapter 10, is still thinking about dietary laws of the Old Testament. Here we are, way back in the Gospels, Peter's thinking about dietary laws, not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. Oh, Jesus, why did you say that? I don't understand that. He doesn't understand it all the way to Acts 10. When God finally has to slap him upside the head and say, Peter, wake up. Do you not understand what I have done now with the church? It's going to be not a Jewish body, but it's going to have Jews. It's going to have Samaritans. It's going to have those who are neither male nor female. It's going to have those who are female heads of the houses and those who are male heads of the houses. It's going to have Gentiles. It's going to have former disciples of John by the time we get over to chapter 20. It's going to be one body in Christ. The things that related to the dietary laws of Israel don't apply anymore. So Peter is saying here, Declare unto us this parable. And Jesus said, Are ye also yet without understanding? Do you not understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the draught? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murders, 
adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but we eat with unwashed hands. Defiles not a man. Did you do it just right when you stuck your hands there and the pitcher of water was poured over the hands and you let it run down your elbows so you wouldn't have dirt running down on your hands so that your hands would really be clean? All the phar Pharisaic regulations. James echoes the teachings of Jesus in James 3.6. He talks about what comes out of the mouth. The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among the members that it defileth the whole body and is set on fire the course of and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. People guard your tongues. If any man can control his tongue, the same can control his whole body. James explains that. But our tongue reveals what's in our hearts. Those are the things that defile a man as they come out of his mouth. The fourth area of defilement in the Old Testament is defilement by touching a dead body. Leviticus chapter 2, chapter 7, chapter 11, I'll read only three independent verses. Or if a soul toucheth any unclean thing, whether it be a carcass of an unclean beast, or the carcass of an unclean cattle, or the carcass of unclean creeping things, and if it be hidden from him, he also shall be unclean and guilty. In other words, even if you didn't know you touched it, you were guilty. Doesn't that seem kind of unfair? He doesn't know he's touched it, but he is unclean. God said so. Leviticus 7, And the flesh that toucheth any unclean thing shall not be eaten. It shall be burnt with fire, as for the flesh all that be clean shall eat thereof. If you had a piece of meat, and you were getting ready to cook it, and some unclean bug hopped on it for just a second, you had to throw it away. Chapter 11, Whosoever beareth aught of the carcass of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the even. The fifth way in which we find unclean used in the Old Testament is for certain diseases like leprosy. Just a few verses here. And the priest shall look on the plague in the skin of the flesh, and when the hair in the plague is turned white, and the plague in sight be deeper than the skin of the flesh, it is the plague of leprosy, and the priest shall look on him and pronounce him unclean. A few verses later, if the priest see that, behold, the scab spreadeth in the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean, it is leprosy. Seven more verses later, and the priest shall see the raw flesh and pronounce him unclean, for the raw flesh is unclean, it is leprosy. Thirty verses later, and the leper in whom the plague is, his clothes shall be rent, and his head bare, and he shall put a covering upon his lip, and shall cry, unclean, unclean. And all through scripture we see lepers doing that in fulfillment of the Old Testament command to lepers. Leprosy included not only leprosy in a person, but also leprosy in clothing and in houses which were considered unclean. This is the law of the plague of leprosy in a garment of woolen or linen, either in the warp or in the woof or in any of thing of skin, to pronounce it clean or to pronounce it unclean. Then the priest shall command that they empty the house before the priest go into it to see the plague, that all that is in the house be made not unclean, and afterward the priest shall go in to see the house. Then the priest shall command that they take away the stones in which the plague is, and they shall cast them into an unclean place without the city, like if you had mold on your wall. And he shall cause the house to be scraped within, round about, and they shall pour out the dust that they scrape off without the city into an unclean place. Then the priest shall come and look, and behold, if the plague is spread in the house, it is a fretting leprosy in the house, it is unclean. And he shall break down the house, the stones of it, and the timber thereof. How would you like to have leprosy declared on your house? You know, maybe you got some mold in the basement today. They scrape it and the thing comes back. You know what would happen to your house? which around here will cost you $300,000 or more. It has to be torn down, and it all has to be carried to the dump. That was the law of uncleanness for leprosy in the Old Testament, for a house. I have a question for you. Do you really want to be back under the law? 
There are so many believers today who think that's the way to go. For you are not under the law, but under grace, says the Apostle Paul. The grace of God which cleanses us by the blood of Christ from all sin. I'm almost done. I see folks looking at their watches. Moreover, he that goeth into the house all the while that it is shut up shall be unclean until the even. To teach when it is unclean and when it is clean, this is the law of leprosy. In the Old Testament, uncleanness also applied to what we've already seen, things related to sexual matters, defilement coming from sexual discharge, defilement by all forms of immorality. These are still things alluding back to the Old Testament from which we are to separate. 2 Corinthians 6.17 Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Remember in the Old Testament, when they touched a dead animal, they were unclean. When they touched a dead bug, they were unclean. Well, Paul is speaking in terms in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 in terms of moral issues, in terms of doctrinal issues. But he refers back to the business of even touching the unclean thing. If you don't want to touch it, don't get near to it. And then God says, I will receive you and will be a father unto you and you should be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. There are serious penalties for violating the law of uncleanness. Moreover, the soul that shall touch any unclean thing is the uncleanness of man, or any unclean beast, or any abominable unclean thing, and eat of the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offerings. That is, you come in to eat holy things which pertain unto the Lord, even that soul shall be cut off from his people. That's a phrase that is used for capital punishment in the Old Testament. God's people were to be holy, and that was what the law of uncleanness symbolized. The Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee. When you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest you die, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, and that you may put a difference between holy and unholy, between unclean and clean, and that ye may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord hath spoken unto them, by the hand of Moses. Uncleanness, unclean spirits. It's a major issue in Scripture. In the Old Testament, the children of Israel were given symbols and pictures which graphically portrayed for them what uncleanness was in the sight of a holy God. And the penalty for violating the laws of uncleanness, the penalty was death. How much more are those today, who having the holy, not the unclean, but the Holy Spirit dwelling in them, who begin to hold hands and touch the unclean things in the spirit realm and in the moral realm. Well, our time is up for tonight. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the privilege of studying your word. A very overview of the issues of uncleanness tonight, and yet so essential for us to understand as we consider the huge number of unclean spirits that are in the world today seeking to influence individual men and women and boys and girls, seeking to overturn our culture, which was founded upon the scripture and upon the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ seeking to tempt Christian men and women and children into that which is in your sight unclean. We pray, Father, that you will make us a pure people. As we look forward to the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are reminded that every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. You have not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who has also given unto us his Holy Spirit. Cause us to be warned, cause us to take seriously and not to despise. For, Father, when we despise, we're not despising man, we're despising God. Make us a holy people, a pure people, a people 
who are a clean vessel that is fit for the master's use. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.